Well, hey, friends, welcome again inside the Basket Maker Studio. I'm Matt Tommy, your host, and super excited to have uh, Ann Coddington with me, who is not only incredible artist, but influencer in the fiber world, teacher, uh, professor, shall I say, and just all around awesome person. And thank you so much for being on with me today. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. I'm remembering back, I guess the only time we actually met in person was when you brought a classroom full of folks from Penland to my studio in Asheville. That was what I can't even remember, five, six years ago, maybe? Yeah, it was. Actually, we met once before that. That's why I contacted you when I taught at Penland. We met at the MBO conference. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. At, at Aramont. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? You yeah. know, I, I don't know if your brain is like mine. Anything pre-COVID, it just it just like a mist at this point. So. Right. It barely happened. <laughs> I know it. I know it. So, well, hey, listen, you have been an inspiration to me and I know to lots and lots of makers for years, just all that you do creatively and the work that you're creating. But for those folks maybe who are, are just getting to know you and, and what you do, why don't you give us the the thumbnail sketch of, of who you are, what you're doing right now, and then we'll kind of jump into a little bit of, of your backstory, maybe. Okay. Um, so I, my undergraduate degree was from Colorado State, and that was in fibers in the mid 80s. And then um, I worked for a while as a textile designer in LA. I did all my undergrad work was in surface design. Mm. And so when I moved to LA, I got a a job at a textile uh, garment manufacturer designing screen print. And so I did that for about five years and then decided I wanted to go back. I really wanted to make work and working full time didn't afford me enough time to do that. So yeah. I decided to go back and maybe think about teaching. My, my dad was a professor. My mom had been a teacher, my grandmother taught in rural Illinois in a one-room schoolhouse. So wow. I guess, I know, right? I guess teaching sort of in the blood. So um, so I started applying for grad schools and, um, and decided I wanted to go back to the Midwest, uh, so w where my family was. And I ended up going to the University of Illinois and I uh, got a graduate degree there in the early 90s uh, from the University of Illinois in wow. sculpture. So um, I decided to move sort of towards sculpture, partly because they didn't have a fibers department. And I thought, you know, a lot of fibers departments were closing down. And I thought, you know, if I want to teach, I need something, some MFA and something that I can use, uh, move forward with teaching. Yeah. And so then I, as soon as I graduated in the early 90s, I started exhibiting widely um, let me back up a second. Yeah. One really cool thing about getting a degree in sculpture was at the time in fibers and crafts, everybody was like, is it art? Is it craft? Is right, it right. You know? Where's the line? And, right. <laughs> right. And in the sculpture department, they didn't care a whit about that. They just said, what are you going to make and what does it mean? And so it really pushed me toward content based sculptural work and mm. Um, and they, they were really completely willing to, by the mid nineties, accept whatever material I wanted to work with and call it sculpture. So that was really cool. Yeah. Um, so I started exhibiting my work straight out of grad school and then taught part-time for about 10 years. And then, uh, since 2004, I've been teaching at Eastern Illinois university. Um, I teach drawing all levels of drawing, 2d design, 3d design. And I'm the graduate coordinator there. So, wow. and I'm just this close to retiring. <laughs> so you have yeah. nothing going on pretty much in your life. You're just kind of easy. No, yeah. just <laughs> hanging out. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, I'm listening to your journey and, and it's amazing, I think, for all of us creatively, how our journey evolves. The thing that we start out doing is not the thing that, that we, um, you know, end up doing. And it's all along the way, it seems like this, convergence begins to happen all these memories and ideas and thoughts and desires all coming together and when I when I think of your work I immediately think of multiples and I don't know if that's intentional or not but I'm always think when I anytime I see a wall of of woven things 
I think that must be Anne. What is it about your that aesthetic and, and that way that you approach your work? As a, you know, some people are kind of like I've kind of been known over the years with these big you know wall hangings and branches and things like that, and other people you know other single sculptural forms. But for you, multiples have really been a I don't know, just just what I I think of you as as, as an artist. So where what's that about? Where does it come from? It's funny. I mean, I for many many years I never did that. Um, but then what ended up happening, the first group of multiples I made was a friend of mine that was living in Turkey at the time said, hey, do you want to do this project called Mother Memory? And it'll be you and me and this other woman and we'll all do these pieces and then we'll um, exhibit it in these different locations. And so I'm one of those people that just when somebody says something like that, I'm like, yes, sure. Yeah, yeah I absolutely do. And um, and so I, for that project, Mother Memory, I just started making small kind of sculptures that uh, worked together as a group and talked about either being a mother or being a child or, you know, that relationship. And so uh, they were often like one thing inside of another thing or lean, you know, some kind of symbiotic relationship. And so uh, it really was somebody else's idea that propelled me to make this group of work. And, um, and then after I, and after that kind of ended, I decided just to keep going with making these small pieces that I still call mother memory. And, um, and it's a way of playing. I think we kind of get caught up in thinking, oh, what's this big thing I'm going yeah. to make? And I realized that I spend a lot of my time just sort of fiddling around with materials and trying combinations and, and relationships. Like I hang stuff up in my studio and, and that I'm thinking about and looking at those, like how different materials and different processes and shapes kind of create a dialogue over space. And, and I also think it taps into our and they, most people love to collect something and, or like pick up shells on a beach or whatever it is. And, um, and I think that we have a propensity as human beings to kind of look at and collect small things and think about them. So yeah, um, yeah so there was that. And then the most recent group that I had, which is called 95 Forms, very simply, yeah. um, was, uh, somebody saw, uh, let's see, the Moss Art Center in yeah. uh, at Virginia Tech yeah. said, oh, hey, we want to include your work in an upcoming show we're having. And uh, we want to include the piece. I said, sure, that sounds great. What piece do you want to include or what are you looking at? And they said, well, we really like your piece, Studio Wall. And it's like, well, actually, Studio Wall isn't a piece. It's actually my Studio Wall. <laughs> it is what it says it is. Right? Yeah. So that, and, and so, but it was really funny because it was kind of like this. I just yeah. had posted a picture on Instagram of all of these things that I've been thinking about. And these were sort of larger forms. And, and uh, they said, that sounds great. I said, I'll make as many as I can because the project wasn't for another year and then COVID. So yeah. I had a little lead time. And so it ended up being 95 uh, forms. And that's a, a group of work that's going to be um, at the International Fiber Biennial in Pittsburgh coming up How in fun. June. How fun. You know, yeah. when, when you're creating, um, I'm just interested in your perspective on this, I guess. Um, when, when I got into doing baskets, um, from a, I was doing traditional baskets and I was selling them and doing, you know, some guys play golf, some go fishing. I made baskets. That was my, my fun thing that I did, you know, that I never told anybody about. Right. And then when I started doing this pro professionally in 2009, I, I guess my business background and sort of my practical mind, I immediately started thinking, well, how can I sell these? How can I create forms that are going to be commercially viable and that sort of thing. So my whole, I guess, basketry career has kind of been in the commercial space of, you know, luxury homeowners and commissions and all that sort of thing. There's this whole other world of people, though, that almost seem 
strange to me that like what you're doing that approach their work from an exhibition standpoint that it's this uh, much more a journey of creativity and I, I'm always wondering to myself is she selling these do you want to sell them are these just your expression of of your creativity and the the payoff that you get is uh, the exhibition the interaction the you know because and and you're primarily doing what you do in teaching it's kind of two different ethos if if you will I'm just interested to kind of get in in your world of how that makes sense because I, I will say this this is maybe telling on myself I love it when somebody like pays me for work and so th I know that I had a lot of identity like stuff wrapped up into that and sometimes that would even stand in the way of me pressing into other things creatively because I knew if I kept doing that it would sell am I, am I having a therapy session maybe but I, I don't know <laughs> Oh, no. I'm just interested in the way you approach your work because, you know, I've been on the commercial side of things for so long, I guess. So, yeah, yeah. You know what? I need a little bit more of what you've got growing. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I, one thing, one reason I decided to do teaching was because being a professor, they considered my studio work research. Mm. So, and, and really, it freed me to make whatever I wanted. I yeah, didn't have yeah. to rely on my work to make my living. Um, that said, boy, would I love to sell some work. Wouldn't <laughs> all of art, right? All right, artists right. love to sell work. I don't sell very much. And it doesn't. And it's been, I guess, a luxury for me not to have to worry about that. Right. I can just follow what, whatever creative path I want. And I don't have to rely on a market-based approach to making sure. which I totally respect and understand um yeah. but and really I'm about to retire and I I really want to start I, I haven't even really pursued galleries as much mostly mm -hmm. just public exhibition and and uh, which I love because because for one they sometimes have funding to put up a show or to bring me into lecture or whatever and or have a workshop but also um you know, it's, it's, they don't, it's not around the idea of making money. So, but I really could, I would like to hook up with some galleries and try to, because I think the work would look good in a, yeah. in different, in commercial and private collections. I just haven't um, the, had the necessity to pursue it in that, in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Often just kind of I, in, in, I guess the last couple of years with COVID and changes and all that sort of thing. And I've kind of taken a different direction. Uh, my art is more of a, a get to right now, not a, not a have to as it has been. And it is fun to be able to just play. And I've actually started doing cold wax painting and I'm doing these big 48 by 48 paintings. And I, then I thought, well, I can't do this without basket. So I've, I've started, you know, I was inspired by, of course, Lisa Hunter and all the stuff that she did with you know, multiples. And I said, let's cut a hole in some of these paintings and stick baskets out of it. You know, just I'm having so much fun, but I think, gosh, I, I don't know that I would have given myself that freedom uh, being in the full-time gallery studio world that I've been in the last 10 years. And so it's, um, I think we all, no matter what we're doing, we have to go back to that place of play and experimentation to, to stay fresh and, and all of that. So. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's those times when I, like I remember I'm looking across my desk and seeing this crochet thing over a rock and I'm thinking, oh yeah, I remember I was teaching a workshop one time and, and um, I always had wanted to learn to crochet and there was a student, we had a, a little bit of a break and I asked this one student who was sitting there crocheting, will you teach me how to do that? You know, and I just wanted to play with it as, yeah, a, yeah. as a new way to make something. Um, but my first, about 10 years, all I did was twining, like, you know, like, bring my, yes, this yeah. guy over, I don't know if you can see it, but yeah. like this kind of twining, um, and, um, and so for 10 years, that's all I did was these really solid forms, and what I realized is I wanted to, you know, after doing that for, for many, many years, I decided I wanted to open it up and make things that were see-through, and that you could have one thing inside of another thing or, you know, have more like netted or open forms in relation. And it's only through play that we discover those kind of things. And yeah. I really just think 
don't you think we're all kind of like big little kids? Absolutely. <laughs> well, we just found a way to, to keep playing, right? We just that's right. I'm, I'm thinking you said, you know, mentioned twining. I, I that's another thing I think when I think of of you, I think of twining. And I'm I'm thinking back uh when I first met Michael Davis um years ago, and he became a real mentor uh to me and you know so loving and so brash at the same time <laughs> just a great you know kind of father figure uh creatively to me but he told me i was making rib baskets at the time just these you know rustic kind of uh rib baskets here in the mountains and he was like matt you got to learn how to twine twining will change your life you know and and he begins to you know tell me about all this and was twining the first thing that, that you started with in, in the fiber world or kind of where did you start technique wise in, in what you're doing? So, well, I got my undergrad degree in fibers. And when I first went to college, I went in interior design, which I still think I would have loved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But back in the 80s, um, interior design wasn't in the art department. It was in like home ec or something. Wow. And yeah. And I was sitting in this nutrition class at one point and I'm like, wow, this is not where I belong, you know, <laughs> learning about like riboflavin or something. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, no, 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 wait, I got to get into an art situation. And so I, so fought, through the, the, one of the required classes in this interior design major was a fibers class. And I just jumped deep into that. And one thing I love about fibers is that my gosh, the breadth of techniques that we learned in my undergrad fibers was just astonishing. Like everything from loom weaving to quilting to stitching to paper making to book making to crochet to knitting to, I mean, it just goes yeah, to yeah. netting to, not, and that's not even, we haven't even started talking about basketry. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Learned, right? Then we learned coiling and, um, and uh, plating and twining and all these other things. And screen printing was what I focused on, honestly. I developed a, a series of, um, of screen prints, like I did yardage, I did huge 20, 20 feet or 20 yards, or I don't know, uh, huge pieces of fabric that I would make these uh, sort of installation kind of things out of. Um, but then when I went back to college, I was, so I was in Los Angeles and I went to Cal State Long Beach, um, cause I was kind of wanting a, to do something really creative. And I had the tremendous, exceptional good fortune of crossing paths with Carol Shaw Sutton and Lisa Hart. Wow. Who, yeah, right. They were, they're just like incredible teachers, incredible creative people. And, um, and Carol was the head of the fibers for many years there. And she taught me, like, I just took some general classes with them, both of them. And, and then Carol kind of, you know, if you've ever been a, in a fiber professor's office, they're like the most amazing, beautiful things. You just shelves of really cool stuff. And she had these twined pieces on her shelf, Carol did. And I said, what is that? I mean, uh, cause I, the material she used, which are the materials now I use, which is wax lim linen and, uh, Italian spring twine. Um, I said, what is that? And she said, oh, this is, it's twining. And it was like a Friday afternoon and she had this little twined piece and she threw it at me and she said, here, you can figure this out <laughs> because right. Cause yeah, right. fiber people. Yeah. I could look at it yeah. and I could suss out what was actually going on there. And so. I took it home and it took me all weekend to make something like this big and maybe that big around, yeah, yeah. but I did it. And I didn't know how to like start or end the, we, I called it warp and weft because yeah. I wasn't really a basket maker at the time, oh, sure. but um, yeah, but that was kind of the launch. And then she taught me a ton more about twining and just showed me different things. And, um, and then uh I was going to order some materials. This is where I went off the deep end, right? <laughs> I, I, she was going to, I was going to order some materials and you could buy the spring twine in one pound balls or a five pound spool or a 50 pound spool. And like a crazy person. I Why not? 50 <laughs> yeah. It was just this, it took me 
I don't know, 12 years to get through this 50 pound spool oh of Ruby spring time. It was just like, came, you know, it was like this, literally this big around oh and my two God. feet tall. And I just, I, I just decided I'm going to deep dive into this process. I, I married that process back then. And I just, and so then everything, you know, like I, I would have to invent, like, I thought about it sculpturally, right? Mm -hmm. So if I wanted a tube form, I had to figure out, well, how do I start instead of starting with the flat bottom? How do I start yeah. with an opening? Mm -hmm. And I just had to figure it, I had to invent like ways of starting and ways of ending and intersecting and, you know, just to figure out what, what to make and what, how to achieve what I wanted to make. So, yeah, I think that's so, the yeah. fun part of it. Though, it? That's the, that's like me with the natural materials I've used. Everything that I was reading about kudzu was, I was like, that's not right. Who, who wrote this book? You know, And I, I would do it my way. And then, but you kind of work in a vacuum. And over the years, you're like, oh, I think I made some, I invented something, but it's just your way of doing it. It's not that you in, intended to do anything special necessarily, but it's just your, that's your right. way of creating, right? So that's right. Yeah. Like, Cause see, then I, when I met you, I, that was the first time I'd ever taught a workshop in what I do. And wow. uh, oh my gosh, it was insane. Uh, like <laughs> these crazy, like really great, great basket makers. I didn't know the basket making community at the time. And Joe Steely brought me in and, um, and introduced me, asked if I would teach and introduced me to all these people. And I, I mean, I realized short like right the night before the class started I realized I was like oh my gosh I got my class list I'm like oh my gosh this is like basketry royalty are my students was like Flo Hoppy was in my class I'm like oh my god what am I going to teach Flo and Willie Ziegler and Sherry West I mean there was all these people that the inner were, critics like you suck you're not <laughs> exactly <laughs> I don't know anything <laughs> so but what, and I said that, you know, I just messed up on the first day. I said, you know what, you guys, I, you're my people. I mean, I didn't even know I had a tribe, Yeah. but I was like, you guys are my people. And mm. I have no idea what I can teach you. You already know all this. And they're like, no, 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 no. We want to know how to, the stuff I invented, you yeah. know, these ways of starting and different kind of uh, troubleshooting that I just yeah. landed on these ways of doing things. And and it was so much fun. I mean, I, my whole mind was so blown. I don't teach because I want to tell people what I do. I teach so that I can learn from them. Mm, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the amount that I learn is twice as much, I think is what I actually teach, but anyway. Um, yeah. So I, I was the first workshop I taught and I've, I've taught a lot since. Yeah. And and, you know, figured I had to like really look at what I was doing, like make handouts. And I mean, it was like, wow. This is a thing, oh my, right? <laughs> yeah, this is like, right, right. Yeah. You know, when I think of your work, I also think of uh, kind of serenity and sort of this spiritual nature. And I don't know if that's intentional or not, but it's so your work is peaceful, it's serene, it, it makes me feel calm and rested and that sort of thing. And I, I know that you, like I believe art is a language that we have this opportunity to really speak through. And I'm just interested in, you know, if, if art is a language, what are you trying to say? Or are you intentionally trying to say anything? Or are you just allowing it to speak as it speaks? And, um, and why do you think what we're doing as makers is so important at this time in the world, especially with all of the techno focus, it seems as, you know, everything's going online, everything's going on digital what's the place for the visceral, the tangible, the, the nature of what we do? Wow. That's like, those are like th five, ten, five or 10 questions. Really right great. There. Questions. Um, so, so, so I'll, I'll try to work my way backwards. Yeah, if I can yeah. remember. Um, well, one of the most interesting things I think that we can do as makers is to keep traditions alive. And so, um, I think that like the, I was researching a little bit into twining and, and looping or knotless netting and realizing that these technologies go back to Neolithic people yeah. like 20,000 years ago. It's just incredible to me 
that I'm participating in a practice that was co-evolved in different mm. parts of the world yeah. simultaneously, thousands, and probably even before that. Those are yeah. just the first examples of, of twining specifically and also knotless netting. Um, and just to, I think it's sort of almost, um, I don't know, revolutionary in a way to participate in a practice that is so backward, that is so, it's sort of like a revolt to say, okay, you guys are scrolling and digital and blah, 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 and technological, and I'm going to back it up. I'm going to go backwards technologically and see what I can do with these techniques that were invented before people even, you know, really early human yeah, beings yeah. engaged in and try to sort of extract or feel the value of what, what, you know, for them, of course, it was survival and it was utilitarian. Mm -hmm. And I live in a world where uh, I have the luxury of just being able to make non-utilitarian forms. So, but I think it's really, uh, it, it changes, and this is sort of connected to the, your first question, which was about spirituality. And uh, I think that um, when, like, if my mind is feeling like, ah, you know, yeah. All I have to do is just start weaving and just that repetitive practice, you know, any kind of art form, whether it's, you know, playing the piano or, um, you know, dancing or sure. what have you, if you engage in something that I think it changes the way, literally the way your brain is putting thoughts together. Yeah. And so when I start just twining and repeating those stitches over and over, the crazy noise that can be in my head, just like zones, you know, chills out a bit. Yeah, yeah. And, and I feel really peaceful. It really is a place of quiet internally that I think is reflected back out in the work. Mm. And yeah, then you I also- have, And I think that, you know, for me, it's, you do get in that zone and I, I'm amazed like just the other day I was painting, but this has happened so many times in basketry too. I was, I was thinking through all this stuff in my head and I just kept feeling being drawn to the studio. So I just, I went in and I just started painting and just started getting in, you know, to what I was doing in silence. And all of a sudden, once all that cleared out, the answer that I was looking for is like, bing, here it comes. <laughs> it just drops in, but it's like that meditative practice of making, I think, just it does clear the mind and I for me at least I've seen that intention or that place that I create from that comes through when people interact with the work and they may need it's not even tangible for them but I can think of so many times people coming into the gallery over the years and they're like doggone it this is the most peaceful studio or something's different there's a different atmosphere different energy in here and i I just love that. I think that's the the supernatural, mystical part of what we do as as makers, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I also think too, what's cool about fibers and basketry specifically is two things. The first is, well, there's a gazillion things that's cool about <laughs> basketry and fibers, but these two things are really cool. Um, one is we all, when we approach an object that's made of in a certain technique, like like knitting or basketry or any of the fiber techniques, whether we think about that as we're looking at that work or not, it's embedded in our material experience of life, right? So mm. this is made of fiber. We're sitting yeah. in a chair that's, we're walking on a carpet where we interact, we sleep in it, we're born into it, we die into fiber, right? Mm. So it's, it's, it's sort of intrinsically, uh, within our body memory. And so when you walk up to an object in a gallery or museum or studio, and it's made of that material in those processes that you saw your grandma sitting on the couch or you know, who, whomever, sure. stitching or whatever, uh, it, it, you connect to it physically, whether, which is different, I think, I really think it's different than if you see a sculpture carved out of stone or a sculpture made out of bronze which it can be exquisite and beautiful mm -hmm. but at the same time we we think of that material as sort of this 
um, elevated other precious material. And these other, the materials that fiber people work with are materials of our domestic existence. And I think that is an avenue into the work that I appreciate. Yeah. And then, the, yeah. And then the second thing is also not only many materials in basketry are connected with the natural world, which again, you might not come up to a basket and think, oh, a tree, but it actually is made of a tree. Yeah, sure. And it resonates with that, um, you know, that materiality resonates, mm -hmm. even if it's not on the subconscious level, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I always love that. Of You know, I, I tell people all the time, I, I never became a basket maker because of baskets. I became a basket maker because it was an excuse to get out of the woods and, and play with the materials. And I just always thought it was neat as a kid. I can pull these vines down and make something and people think it's really great. And I, I love to be able to bring that picture of something, you know, of, of the essence of that, that materiality into people's homes and for, as, as a memory point, as a, as a touch point of, of nature that they can continue to enjoy uh, in their work. So it's just, it's just great to be an artist in it, man. It's, <laughs> it's so great. It's such a privilege, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think about that all the time, especially lately with what's going on in the world. But I think of all the time how lucky, and I say this to my students all the time, yeah. aren't we lucky that we can spend this afternoon drawing together or whatever? You yeah. know, that is such a place of privilege. And we need to recognize that, I think. I think it's important to acknowledge that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, as in the work that I do, not only making, but trying to inspire artists as well, I think the more we live out of that place of beauty, the more that gets transmitted and communicated in, in the world. And it hopefully inspires others to, to do what it is that, that they're, that's on their heart, that they're, they're created to do. And I just, I love that. If we could all, if we could all live from that place, hello, that would, <laughs> that would be a beautiful, a beautiful place to live from. So yeah. Yes, definitely. Well, yeah. hey, can can we while we're there? Can can I know you're on your phone? Can you show us a little bit of what's going sure. on in your studio? And uh, yeah, let us see this yes, I work. can. <laughs> Excuse my creaky chair. No, this, this is the fun part, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I'm gonna just walk over here, and then I'll turn this around. So this, so here's my. I'll try to move slowly because I know how sort of. So I'm up here on. Um, on the fifth floor. Beautiful. Of, I got this really nice, um, let me unplug so I can back up. Yes. I have really nice sort of natural north light. Mm. And um, this is, these are, let me get my sweater out of the way. Can I flip my camera around? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, nice. All right, so, so this is a wow. form that I, a basket form that I made when, when our COVID numbers had reached 200,000, mm. I wanted to know what does 200,000 look like? Wow. And so I just, I pulled off six feet of uh, the, what I warp or spokes and I started twining. And if you can see here this, so that, it, you won't believe this, but that's 100,000. So wow. all of those, like if you look, this is like one person, one person, one per. I couldn't, I just, I wanted to visually realize what 200,000 looks like. And I thought for sure in this big of a piece, I would hit 200,000, but I didn't. Wow. That was 100,000. And then this piece, it ended up being 144,000. So I had to make another one. That's what this companion piece is. My goodness. And um, that's when I hit 200,000. And so this wow. one is just going to stand next to that. And now that we're so close to a million, I just, I can't keep going, but I'm going to finish these two. And I think they're, they speak to that kind of the vastness of the losses that we're facing yeah. Yeah. With, with that. This is a, so this is a piece I recently made, I've never made a piece like this. This is in Willow. And I uh, have a great graduate student I'm working with, Katie Ambrose. And she uh, and I went and took a class with Joe Campbell Amsler. Oh, yeah. 
along with Lindsay Ketterer Gates, she met us there and we all took a class um, in doing willow. And I love like learning traditional techniques and then figuring out how am I gonna kind of push that yeah. into some sculptural. So that was cool. And then this one was Scott Gilbert and Beth Hester. I also took that graduate student and we did a workshop with them last fall. Terrific workshops. We were just so blessed to have yeah. that. Um, yeah, and then just other projects that I've been working on, these larger woven forms Love are it. part of a series called the Albatross Project, mm. and um, which is probably, I could go into. Um, and then <laughs> this is, I'm making a commission right now of slip cast. This is one of the prototypes for it. I I'm saw doing, that on social media. Oh my gosh, it's so cool. Yeah, it's fun. I'm doing slip cast. They're kind of like the shape of a monarch chrysalis, if you know what that yeah, it looks yeah. like, the shape. And so I'm slip casting them ceramic and um, it's going to be, uh, and then they're glazed white and then they're going to be hung in the education building at the University of Illinois. So wow, beautiful. that's a little bit about what I'm doing. Um, so cool. Yeah, you making most of your work right there in in your space there. And yep, I sit in this chair, and I, it all happens. Yeah, and I, I look out my window, and and um, that's where I weave from, and then I do drawing and calligraphy a little bit to kind of keep loose, and um, yeah, got so some cool. stuff. Oh, I, love, I love to play with rocks, wrap stones this one so fun <laughs> i love those little. And i know right this is this is the crochet oh, i figured yeah. out how to do crochet around a form so yeah um i'm the member of nbo yay <laughs> NBO poster a shout oh, out cool. to i'm so uh everyone is a member's exhibit of nbo and um so just a shout out to, to the NBO group. We're having Absolutely. another everyone show this summer and everyone that enters gets in. Wow, so, wow. I know, isn't that cool? Yeah, this is such a great organization. I mean, just, I think for all of, I'll put the, actually put the link to the, uh, to NBO for folks to join if they want in the, in the notes here, because I think it's just, a, it's a great place to connect with other makers and so many it great really places is. now. I mean, not only, MBO, I think, as far as the mothership, you know, but also so many great Facebook groups out there and other kind of groups that are are gathering makers. It's just uh, it's it's great for us to link arms and and continue the journey. So, and thank you so much for being on and just sharing the journey. I've I've had a great time. I hope you have as well. And I have had such a great time, Matt. I you made such a positive impression on me when I met you at Aramont. I just thought oh. you were you were just so. Uh, open and willing to share and and just and then when you then so I taught I was teaching at Penland when I brought the group and I'm teaching at Penland again this coming summer cool. so maybe we'll cross paths again but I you were so nice to tour my students around and and so generous and I just want to say thank you I appreciate you so much well you're so very welcome and I want to give you the opportunity I know that folks are want to go on going to want to connect with you and see other work that you're creating so website social media where would you prefer that we point people uh that, that want to connect with you further and see your work so you know it's so much easier nowadays to keep everybody up to date with on instagram isn't yeah, it great yeah so it's ab it's at ab coddington i try to keep up my inst my uh web page with all the like events and stuff that i'm sure. doing uh, and upcoming shows and workshops and stuff. So you can also find that there, but the images are more up to date on Instagram. Awesome, awesome. If you just Google my name, you can find the website. That's where Let's I follow you. So we'll, we'll be sure to put the link on there, but Ann Coddington, thank you so much for being on. What a pleasure to have you on the on Thank the you, Matt. Have a great afternoon. Ciao.